Today is the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. On this date also comes the feast of St. Louis of France, a confessor of the faith. The second oration is from the feast day, Mass of St. Louis. And there's a third oration also, beginning with the Latin words, Acunctis, which invokes the intercession of our blessed mother, St. Joseph, and all of the saints in heaven. The epistle for this, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Brethren, I make known unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast after what manner I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Chephas, and after that by the eleven. Then was he seen by more than five hundred brethren at once, of whom many remain until this present, and some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen also by me, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace in me hath not been void. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The gospel is taken from that according to St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus, going out of the coast of Tyre, came by Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring to him one deaf and dumb. And they besought him that he would lay his hand upon him, And taking him from the multitude apart, he put his fingers into his ears, and spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he groaned and said to him, Ephita, which is, Be thou opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke right. And he charged them that they should tell no man, But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal did they publish it, and so much the more did they wonder, saying, He hath done all things well. He hath made both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. He said to him, Epheta, which is, Be thou opened. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, when most of us were baptized as infants, because most of us were baptized as little children, the priest put his thumb to his lips for a brief moment, and then with that them traced the sign of the cross on our ears and on our nostrils. And he said the words that are given to us in the gospel today, Epheta, which is, Be thou opened. It's a small way of reenacting a, a great miracle. Now the priest did this for us while we were in the arms of our godmothers, just before he anointed us on the front and the back with the holy oil of catechumens as the immediate preparation for baptism. Because immediately after that, we enter the baptistry, we go to the baptismal font, and there is one final questioning about the faith, credo. Those words are addressed to the little baby, to us when we were baptized. But our godparents answered for us. And their answer was, Credo, I do believe, I do believe. 
When we were baptized, we received, by grace of that sacrament, the virtue of faith in our souls. It's that virtue which enabled us later to learn the Catechism and to believe the answers the Catechism gave us. It is the virtue of faith that we receive when we are baptized, that was latent in our souls, and then receive the truths of faith when we are first able to learn them. And so you see, this miracle that our Lord worked, which is now commemorated when we baptize, is a matter of opening the ears, but not only the ears to hear the sounds of the world around us, but to open the ears to hear divine teaching, the truths of God in faith. St. Paul, the same St. Paul who wrote the epistle today, tells us that preaching must, preachers must be sent to preach the truth because faith comes by hearing, by hearing the preach, by hearing the truth taught. And so the priest commanded that our ears be opened so that we would be able to hear the words of God in the truths of God, the truths of our faith. Now we are witnessing something today that is unprecedented in the past 50 years or more. We're seeing something happen, and I don't know that many really understand the significance of what is happening. For the first time in all these years since the Second Vatican Council, something dramatic is taking place. It has to do with faith. We see the modernists redefine the word faith. They use the word faith, but to them it means something very, very different than the meaning of faith to a Catholic. The Catholic Church teaches that for us faith is a virtue that God gives us. God gives us the virtue in our minds in our hearts, in our intellects, our wills, to learn and believe the truth that God has revealed through his prophets and, of course, ultimately through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by the virtue of faith that we accept these as true, even though we can't explain them. We can't explain the Blessed Trinity. We can't understand the power by which God became man. We can't understand the power by which God and man, our Lord Jesus Christ, becomes present in the Blessed Sacrament. But we believe these things because he has told us these things. And because he is truth itself, as St. Thomas Aquinas says in the beautiful Adoro Te Devote, we believe him. We believe what we cannot explain. We believe what we cannot fully understand on the basis of God himself being the truth itself and teaching us these truths about him, about himself, and what he does for us. This is faith that enlightens the intellect to accept these things as true because it is God himself who reveals them. That is not what faith means to the modernist. To the modernist, faith is an experience that each individual person has of God directly in our lifetime. Each one has a religious sense, a kind of religious sentiment, which is open to experiencing God. And there are many who in the course of their lives, experience God somewhere in the world today. And they take that experience, and it is their faith. For each individual person has his own experience, his own unique individual personal experience of God. And that is the root of all the different religions of the world. And all of those experiences are true, and so the religions of the world, based upon those experiences, are, to some extent, all true. 
And you might ask, well, how can the modernist explain, though, that these different religions contradict each other and teach different things? How can they all be true? How can they all come from the same God? And the modernist says, well, you see, God is so great, he really can't express himself through just one religion. So he needs many different religions to express, express the various aspects or facets of God and who he is. So you see, they don't believe in God as we do, as we Catholics do. They believe in a God of contradiction who contradicts himself even in introducing himself to mankind. He contradicts himself in all the different religions of the world. And that's necessary to have these contradictions, and they're all good and necessary because God cannot really speak through just one religion and reveal who he is. You see, the modernist doesn't actually believe in the God revealed to us by Jesus Christ. The modernist does not believe in a God of truth, who is all truth, and in whom there is no falsehood. The modernist preaches a God of contradictions. And this background is necessary to understand what's happening now, that we see happening before our very eyes, and we should really appreciate the significance of what it is. But we do need the background to understand it. Those of us who are younger than 60 years old have no personal memories of the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council came to an end on December 8, 1965. And so those who were even born in the year 1965 be approaching 60 years old now. Those of us younger than 60 would just have what we heard. We would go on the basis of what we read, what we learned about Vatican II, but we never really experienced what it was like to be in the world, in the church, while Vatican II was taking place. And even those who were younger than 50 really don't have much memory of the church before the changes came in, because the changes came soon after Vatican II was over. The changes in the sacraments, the changes in the catechism, and so on and so forth, they followed very rapidly after Vatican II. Now what happened at Vatican II was a revolution. Vatican II was called by John XXIII, who had just become Pope in 1958. And within a couple of years, he was already calling for a council. And he said the purpose of the council was to open the windows of the church, let the fresh air in. I'm not sure where the fresh air was supposed to come from. From the world? That's not fresh air out in the world. He said it was going to take a new approach of mercy. He said it was going to bring the church up to date and make it relevant to the modern world. He even issued encyclicals, such as Popolorum Regressio, in which he talked about what was most important to the church was the development of the world and the nations of the world and their economies and so on. So you see, John XXIII, already before Vatican II, was using the same language and had the same ideas that Francis has right now. The same ideas. It's just that now we see that they've come so far that they've become very radical. But they were just starting out back then to lay, set the stage, lay the groundwork for the changes that were to come. And so John the Twenty-Third did convoke Vatican II. And in the very beginning days of Vatican II, the work that had been done to prepare for it by the solidly Catholic bishops was all set aside and the radicals, the leftists, the modernists took over. They were favored by John the Twenty-Third. They were put in positions of power to control the council. And when John the Twenty-Third died and Paul the Sixth took over, 
and closed the council. It, the council was firmly in the control of the radical leftists, the liberals, the modernists. And there are those who say that the changes that followed Vatican II were according not to Vatican II, but to the so-called spirit of Vatican II, as though the spirit of Vatican II was different from the actual council. But that is not true, because the spirit of Vatican II was just carrying out the ideas and principles that were laid down at Vatican II. And the same bishops who made the changes after Vatican II were the bishops who were at Vatican II itself, and they were the ones who attended Vatican II, they were the ones who made up Vatican II, they were the ones who voted on the documents of Vatican II. And when they came back and they put into effect what they understood of Vatican II, they, they did understand the principles of the ideas that were given at Vatican II. And that is sometimes, as I say, called the spirit of Vatican II. It is simply following through on the principles and the ideas that were laid down at that council. The bishops involved knew it very well. They're the ones who made the changes. And uh, we saw these changes come in, and these changes actually have become what we know as the new order. They are expressive of a, of a different religion, the religion of modernism. Actually, the new order is the religion of modernism, and modernism is the faith behind the changes, the Novus Ordo. Now, during Vatican II, it became so radical as time went on that there was a group of council fathers, bishops and archbishops, who united together in a group. They called themselves the Cetus Internationalis Patrum, and that means the group, the international group of fathers. They were the conservative ones. They were the ones who were trying to uphold the traditional Catholic faith at Vatican II and withstand the errors that were coming in. They were the ones who saw the evil principles that were putting, putting place by Vatican II and they were trying to hold back the flood, as it were. There were about 70 of them in the end, finally, who voted against the last document of Vatican II on that false religious liberty that Vatican II is so well known for. Among them were the leader of the group, Archbishop Sigod of Diamantina, Brazil, and of course, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. They were those who were leading voices for the Catholics, the, the traditional Catholics at Vatican II. But after Vatican II was over, so many of them just fell silent. There was really only one who spoke very boldly in condemning the errors that came out of Vatican II and speaking up for the faith. And that was Monsignor Lefebvre. There were other bishops who took a supporting role insofar as they would encourage Archbishop Lefebvre. But as far as being the bishop who would, as it were, take action and be called to the Vatican and meet and be the one who would bear the brunt of the attacks of the modernists, it really was Monsignor Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who stood practically alone in dealing with the public voice of the traditional Catholic faith. Now, that must have been very difficult. You can be sure it was very difficult for him to brave the blast of the wrath of the modernists. They did not want anyone to oppose them. They must have been very surprised that even one bishop would stand up against them. They thought everyone would fall in line meekly 
and go along on their adventure of modernism. The very first, the very first sacrament to be changed was the sacrament of holy orders, the ordination of deacons and priests, and the consecration of bishops. That was in 1968, and then a year later, the new mass was announced and then postponed for a year because of the serious defects that were pointed out by some of the bishops. But in the end, a year later, in 1970, the new mass finally was put in place, and it was put in place to completely destroy the traditional mass. Everywhere you looked, the traditional mass was forbidden. It was banned. In fact, for the first 20 years, the traditional mass was forbidden. The only exceptions would be older priests who were retired in nursing homes who could privately offer the traditional mass. But everywhere else, everyone else, had to use the new liturgy. That's how draconian and tyrannical the Novus Ordo was. Now we've come to a point when we're seeing something new, where all the bishops and all the archbishops and all the cardinals that went along with Vatican II all these years are becoming, well, of them, many are becoming uncomfortable because they're seeing the ultimate results now of the principles of Vatican II. They're becoming more obvious, even unmistakable. I've mentioned to you this synod that Francis has called for October in Rome, the Synod on the Amazon. And for that synod, there is a working document called the Instrumentum Laboris. It's like the document that is going to be put in front of all of the members of the synod to study, and they're going to start working from that document to produce ultimately what they all agree on is the work of the synod. Now it could very well be that they will look at that document and put it aside and say, no, we don't approve of this. But it doesn't appear to be going that way because the longer we go and the closer we get to the synod, the more firmly they are holding on to that document as though it represents what the synod is really all about. Even if those who were at the synod in October rejected the document, it's still a very important document because it tells us exactly where the modernists want to take us. It tells us exactly what the modernists want to do to the church and to the world because the document itself says it's just the beginning. It's meant to be a model for what is going to happen throughout the entire church, throughout the entire world. That's their intention. So when you look at that document, you actually see all spelled out there exactly what the modernists have been driving at all the way from the beginning or even before the beginning of Vatican II. This is what they had in mind. And there are certain bishops and archbishops and even cardinals in the Novus Ordo who've gone along with the Novus Ordo all this time who are speaking out and condemning the document of the Synod, the working document. That is something new. That is something we have not seen before. Only Monsignor Lefebvre in the past has spoken clearly and boldly and shown the errors of the modernists and resisted them. But now, even within the Novus Ordo, we have the more conservative bishops and archbishops and cardinals who are speaking out and actually saying that this document that has been approved to put in front of the laymen, the experts, the theologians, the bishops and archbishops and cardinals of the synod, and Francis himself, this document is heretical. 
It contains heresies against the Catholic faith. Yes, some of the Novus Ordo bishops and archbishops and cardinals are actually saying this. Some are even saying that it represents apostasy from the faith. Now, heresy is the rejection of one truth of the faith. one doctrine that the church has declared a dogma. Rejecting that is, makes one a heretic. But apostasy is the complete rejection of the faith, the loss of the faith entirely. And there are some cardinals in the new, in the new Novus Ordo who are actually saying that this working document is a work of apostasy. And what is happening now within the Novus Ordo is altogether amazing to see, even though we could have predicted it. Why? Because if you say, if you divide the Catholics, the lay people and the clergy and the hierarchy into the liberals and the conservatives, then eventually you're going to have a break. They're going to break with each other. And so now, there are those even higher ups in the New Order Church, in the Novus Ordo, who are actually warning about a schism happening within the Novus Ordo. Within the Novus Ordo. A schism between the liberals and the conservatives. This talk didn't really exist just five years ago. It certainly didn't exist in 2013, when Francis was chosen, it didn't exist before him in the time of Benedict XVI or in the time of John, of John Paul II. But we now hear voices within the Novus Ordo talking about schism within the Novus Ordo itself, that they will break off between a liberal Novus Ordo and a conservative Novus Ordo. And the talk is, who will follow Francis and who will not? And it's all about Francis as an individual person. So this is a remarkable development to see actually come to this point where the Novus Ordo has become so radical that they're talking about this happening. What is the solution to this? Well, the solution is exactly what Monsignor Lefebvre said it was. It's exactly what you know it to be. It's exactly what I know it to be. The solution to this problem is to say we're not liberal Catholics and we're not conservative Catholics. We're Catholics and we follow the traditional Catholic faith. The traditional Catholic faith and the traditional Catholic religion and that alone is the answer to that problem. It was inevitable that the Novus Ordo should begin splitting apart like that. If it's on the basis of liberalism and conservatism, if you're going to have different degrees of being Novus Ordo. Yes, that's what happens. That's the very worldly thing of modernism. But for Catholics, it, that doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all because we all hold the traditional Catholic faith. And that is what binds us together. And we all practice the traditional Catholic faith. That is the only solution. It's the only solution to modernism, it's the only solution to the new order, to return to the belief of the traditional faith and to return to the practice of the traditional religion, the traditional Catholic religion. It's the only solution. Well, does G.K. Chesterton say, and I have it in print in the bulletin, as you see, that the Catholic Church is the only thing that can save us from the slavery of being a child of our times. And being a child of our times is exactly what Vatican II is all about. Bringing the church into step with the modern world, making the church relevant with the modern world. A giornamento, right? And all the rest was exactly a matter of making the church a child of the times. 
But G.K. Chesterton pointed out very beautifully in 1926, in explaining why he converted to be the Catholic that he is, he converted from where he started in Unitarianism to become a Catholic. And he explained because, because of the eternal truths of the Catholic faith, the Church saves us from this slavery of our modern times and falling into step with the modern fads and, and the modern false wisdom and all the rest. But Vatican II fell exactly into that step. It really is, because of the modernists, a child of its time. <clears throat> and the new synod coming up in Rome, it will be a child of the times in which we live. But that is not going to make it the church that Jesus Christ established. Quite the contrary. That has to be the traditional Catholic Church as it's established by Christ and guided by the Holy Ghost throughout history to maintain the truth that Christ himself revealed to us, be faithful to that in word and in practice of the religion, the religion that expresses those truths. My dear faithful, we see this idea expressed actually, this idea of faith expressed in the epistle today. There's a reason why this gospel of the opening of the ears to the faith that is taught by the prophets and the apostles, that was taught by our Lord himself, Jesus Christ, that opening the ears and the mind to receive truths that are divinely revealed, that's what faith really is. <clears throat> that is what corresponds to St. Paul's words in the epistle today. St. Paul says he, he heard the faith, he received it, and then he gave it to others by preaching the faith. Eveta, he says to them, be open to hear the words of the faith, and you will be saved by that faith if you are faithful to it and practice it as St. Paul gave it to you, as the Church has given it to you. He says that if one does not re practice the faith, he receives the faith in vain, because faith alone cannot save. It's being faithful to the faith that enables us to be saved. And then St. Paul talks about the Incarnation, our Lord coming into the world and being our sacrifice, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and then being seen <clears throat> by Chephas, that's Peter, by the eleven, the apostles, and then being seen by 500 brethren at one time, that is not recorded in the Gospel. We don't find that in the Gospel anywhere, but St. Paul reveals it to us here. It reminds us that not all everything, not everything Jesus said or did is written down in the Gospel. And a few things that are not written in the Gospel are given to us by St. Paul. The fact that our Lord appeared to St. James, Jacob, he says, Jacob, <coughs> That is not recorded in the gospel as a separate revelation, revelation of our Lord. But the church herself was established in order to give us the truths of faith and to enable us to understand the gospels and all the scriptures. That is guided by the Holy Ghost. That is what faith is. The belief in these truths given to us by the authority of Christ himself. St. Paul goes on to say that he is the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church. But he tells us that God has given him grace, and the grace that God gave St. Paul has not been void, has not been empty. Well, he also says somewhere else, receive not the grace of God in vain. What does this mean? You and I have received the faith, thanks be to God. We believe the truth revealed to us through the prophets and through our Lord Jesus Christ, God's own Son, and brought down through the centuries through the power of the Holy Ghost in the Catholic Church. We believe that. Now the question is, will we be faithful to it? That's the question. Will that grace be void in us, or will we live that faith? Will we practice that faith? Will we love that faith? I pray, and I know St. St. Paul prays for us today in heaven that we who have received the grace of faith will not receive that grace in vain, but that we ourselves 
will be faithful, will be faithful to Christ, who has given us faith in him. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.